live the life you love. Yeah. All right, we are live. I'm excited to introduce all you guys uh, to Mr. Jeffrey James. Jeffrey, welcome back to the show. Welcome to the Making Academy. Thanks, man. Happy to be back. I really loved our, uh, our last convo. Yeah, it was fun. It was a really fun one. Uh, the last time we talked, it was in June 2017. So it's been almost three years. I, I guess next month will be three years. It's been that long. Um, That's amazing. I know, time flies. What's, what's yeah. been new with you? What's, what's going on since the last three years? Um, a lot of new music. Um, you know, toured a bit, been writing for people, just kind of a lot of the same, really. Um, you know, living in Nashville, so mm-hmm. you kind of juggle as many, you know, artistic balls as you can. And, and, and so that, for me, that's releasing my own music, writing for other people, um, playing shows, writing music for TV and film. Awesome. What are, before, when we talked three years ago, were you, were you writing for other music then too? I mean, writing music for other people then too, or was it mostly yeah. just for yourself at that time? Yeah. No, I definitely was writing for other people. Okay. Um, cool. And the, you know, since then, I think I've had a little more success with it. Just, you know, it's like anything, it depends on the season, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. So you sent me that uh, cool video, which I wasn't even aware, aware about that you were on Songland when I reached out. Um, yeah, good timing there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we have a couple of people here that are fans of the show. So, I have to ask, tell me about your experience on Songland. Songland was great, man. Um, they really do um, appreciate songwriters and they really want the show to be about songwriters. Like it's, it's the least set up of any of those like, you know, contestants, talent show things you could do. Like I almost don't even see it as a talent show. It's really like, you know, it's like Shark Tank for songwriters, <laughs> right? Um, That's a good way so it. Was, it was a really good experience. They took good care of us. Um, Everyone I met, you know, I got to meet, because they were filming simultaneously, I got to meet a few of the other contestants for other episodes, and, like, everyone was very talented, you know, you don't always get that in some of those other shows. Everyone, everyone who was on this show, more or less, was, like, professionals who have been doing this, mm-hmm. um, just trying to make a bigger name for themselves. That's awesome. Yeah. How do you, how does someone get on that show? Did you, like, apply for that show, or is it they something where they reached out to me, man. Um, yeah? I think they found me through my artist stuff online. Um, I don't know. I can't speak for everybody. But that's that's how they. I got I got a got a kind of a cold email one day. Honestly, mm-hmm. yeah. That's awesome. And what's the process like? Is it like how long does it take for them to the film? I guess your episode. Like how many days were you on set? And I was in it? LA for two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. And yeah, if you can imagine, you're not you're not filming every day, but it's they're spacing it out because they are. We were we were filming simultaneously with the her episode that was right before us. Okay. So I actually got to know that, those contestants really great. Um, and so they were they were filming and, and editing all that stuff at the same time. Um, and so two weeks, and actually I'd gotten a call. They had asked me beforehand to um, send in a handful of songs. Like I send in probably like okay. 10 songs. Oh, and okay. um, you knew who all the artists' possibilities were, but then they, the artist teams kind of picked the song for their artists. The artist definitely doesn't hear the song ahead of time, but they're kind of vetted. That's how they mm-hmm. pick which songs they think might the artist might like. Right. And uh, my song was picked for Martina. Um, and yeah, so then I, I literally got a call on a Friday saying that they had booked a ticket for me on uh, for the following Monday to fly. Oh, jeez. So, yeah. <laughs> no yeah. time to prepare. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. That's awesome. And then the, the, so you pre-wrote 10 or you sent them 10 songs and they picked one out of those. Um, I guess from the moment where you, I guess, performed a song for the first time to where you're going to the studio and recording it like is, is that like two, where the two weeks come in like you work on a song in between that time yeah well, i mean the song was already done so and then um the first week was kind of the first half of the episode you see where um they have all the little bit of backstory on us and they film the backstory and then we perform our first song you know in front of um the producers and and the artist and then there was you know they picked the three of us for moving on and then, yeah, the next week was basically like, we had that on-camera time with our producer and then we had one other day to, I mean, not even a day, we had a few hours to like rewrite the song and record it so that the band could relearn it, you know, depending on how much you change. And then you could, and then we probably had another day after that to relearn the lyrics or whatever the new melodies might be. And then you sing it again. So that's, that's about two weeks. And it's like I said, we don't, we're not filming every day. It's just like, you know, a two week time period in our hotel mm. in and out of the studio. That's cool. Yeah. What an awesome experience. Has yeah, anything, correct. has anything come out of that experience? Like has some other songwriters reached out to you or any other new opportunities that came from? Um, yeah, a little bit. I, I, uh, um, one, I mean, just, just from exposure standpoint, as you can imagine, it's yeah. NBC. So like kind of, um, 
a lot of new new fans and people getting excited about my old catalog, my old like my current catalog, um, which mm -hmm. has been really great. So I've I've noticed that on all my socials and on my streaming numbers have have gone up quite a bit from then. People really being interactive too, which is wonderful. That's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, the the quickest thing for me is that actually um, Martina's management company, who they're with um, Red Light Management, had had reached out um, and now want to possibly start working with me so they're, that's awesome they're, it's a it's a giant red light's a giant company and, and yeah it, we're, we're kind of feeling it out still but like just them getting excited and, and they, they were already in nashville so they literally emailed me the day i was flying home they were like hey we loved we were backstage we loved your performance and the song we want to catch up and so it's it's i wasn't expecting it to be too much of like a hey kid you're signed you know whatever <laughs> right after it it's like it's not a movie but that's like that was a great um kind of first step of things for sure that's so cool it's exciting well hope all that goes goes well for you thanks so i want to dive into, into songwriting a little bit yeah. uh, which is one of my foundation pillars so i created or i'm creating this pyramid which is almost ready uh kind of like maslow's hierarchy of needs but it's the artist development pyramid oh, and love that. the foundation of that pyramid is songwriting performing uh content and engaging with fans whether it's on social media or in person right okay. so Get, diving into the songwriting part of it, what yeah. does a typical week look like for you? And maybe like a busier week, like how often do you write? Do you do co-writes? Uh, are there any other things that you work on during the week, kind of fill up your time and kind of yeah. work on your business and performance and so on? I'm very much, I think, because I've been in Nashville so long, anytime I'm writing, it's 95% it's, it's a co-write um, mm -hmm. in Nashville. And I'll probably, on a busy week, if I'm in town, it's writing four days a week. Um, but those sessions usually last, uh, the Nashville style is like three hours or four hours and out kind of thing. So mm -hmm. you're, you're usually writing and recording at the same time. Cause a lot of those guys, honestly, some of the country guys will hop into a session and then hop it, you know, that afternoon they're going to another session. Yeah. Those guys are doing like 10 sessions a week, which blows my mind is way too much for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll do like four, four sessions a week. Um, you know, at the same time, obviously I'm always keeping up with my socials. Um, you know, teeing up videos and, and pictures to post. I try to, I try to, I don't full schedule it too much, but I do try to save them. So I have a bank of stuff that's ready, you know, for if, if I'm like, oh, I haven't posted in a while or I have this coming up. I don't have to scramble to get it done. It's already done. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm usually practicing some set of songs, you know, at nighttime, depending on what shows I have coming up. Um, and that's usually how I go. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Right now, I have a setup where I can I can record vocals at home. So, awesome. you know, yesterday I was writing a song with a friend, and then he sent me the track. I cut the vocals. Um, I had a quick, I had a, a live um, Instagram like interview with another artist. We went back and forth, did, shared some songs, um, and that was, you know, that got me till about seven p.m. at night. So it's like that's kind of where my days are now, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. And last time we talked, you were doing a lot of like songwriter rounds. Are you still doing that? And whether you are or not, can maybe explain a little bit of what the songwriter rounds are and maybe like the benefits of being part of those. Yeah, yeah. I haven't done too many of those in a while. Obviously not for the past couple of months also. But yeah. <laughs> um, I really, I've done more a lot, just a lot more full band kind of shows than what I've been focusing on. Um, but a songwriter round is a, is a great thing, specifically in Nashville. I know they have them in, in, in New York and LA. It's just like, I want to say it was invented here. I don't know if that's the true or not, but um, it's basically, you know, three-ish songwriters with a guitar or a piano on stage, each doing one song at a time and maybe, you know, a 30 minute set, maybe an hour set. So you might get three songs in or you might get like four or five songs and everybody just kind of playing for each other. And then whoever else, it, it could be at a, you just at like a, sometimes they're at cafes or like hotel lobbies where they have like their own cafe and set up. A lot of times they also have like, the listening room is a great venue in Nashville that does a bunch of those. And that's actually a really, that's a couple hundred person venue. Um, mm -hmm. Or even the, the city winery here in Nashville will do them as well. Um, it's just a great kind of low impact way of like, one, just getting better at performing live. Mm -hmm. Two, testing out your songs because, um, you know, a lot of times with those writers rounds, you're just playing to other writers who are waiting for their turn to get on stage. And so, <laughs> If you can win them over, you know you have a good song because yeah. like they don't care about you. They just they want to get their own songs, you know. Mm -hmm. But then in general, just just feeling out how the song plays to an audience, and and there's something you don't know until you really play it in front of someone, whether it's one person or whether it's a hundred people. 
It just feels right. different than when you are just singing it in your own room, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, that was a great jumping off point right when I graduated college. For a while, I was doing like four to five rounds a week. Um, just because, again, they're easy to hop in with your acoustic guitar, plug in real quick, you don't really need a sound check, and then you, you 30 minutes, you're out. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. so cool. It's almost like, so last month we had Andrew Duhon on the podcast and he's based in New Orleans and they don't have songwriter rounds in New Orleans, but yeah. he does these open mic nights over there instead and kind of the same benefits, right? It's kind of way to work on performance, way to work on your songs and test songs in front of a live audience and also and get feedback from the audience. And then also okay. a just great way to build community. So it's almost like the open, some of big comedy fans always use the open mic example. It's almost like those songwriter rounds are Nashville's version of an open mic and just oh, kind of work on your chops. 100%. And honestly, um, they, they kind of combine those a lot of times too, where it might be um, some spots that are smaller will have like, it's an open mic thing, but they do it in a, in a writer's round form. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's like, you got to show up early, you sign up, and then they'll put three of you on stage and you perform and then the next three pop up. So it's, it's really the exact same thing. It's just the Nashville name for it. <laughs> yeah, very cool. You know, it's funny. I played a show in, first show I ever played in New Orleans was, uh, I want to say 2016. And I was doing an acoustic thing at this like swanky bar. And mm -hmm. like, to your point of like, they don't do that kind of thing. Like their minds were like blown. They're like, we've never seen this. Yeah, it's cool. You know, like <laughs> if you've ever been in New Orleans, you know, a stripped down band there is still kind of a very much like New Orleans jazz thing, which mm -hmm. is so cool. I love, there's no music scene like it in the world, but um, oh, yeah. it was just funny. The thing that I see every day in Nashville, they were like, this is amazing. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah it's so different because over there it's it's a horn sections and yeah uh, dude it's very different i love it <laughs> so what are some so that's when i'm starting out with songwriting right i know a lot of like musicians that are newer in their careers and just starting out and they kind of only i guess write when they're inspired um hmm. whereas like as you mentioned you're writing four or five days a week and i'm sure there's days there where you maybe aren't as inspired you might have writer's block like, are there any exercises or strategies on becoming better, like just working on your songwriting and maybe even getting through writer's block? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, it's like practicing anything, right? It's, it's, it's repetition. So um, there's a great quote I'm going to butcher that. I mean, I've even heard novelists talk about it. It's like, I, I will write my best when inspiration comes, but I'm going to be at my desk at 9 a.m. to make sure I'm ready for it when it comes, you know? So okay. it's the more you do it, the more inspiration more easily comes to you and the more like you know again it's just being ready for it so you got to keep keep writing songs i know they say um you have to write 100 good songs before you write one great one and you got to write 100 great songs before you might write that song that's like the hit you know mm -hmm. and that's i I've, I've found that to be really really true i use your quote all the time from from last time we talked of writing 200 songs as quickly as you can throwing them out and i'm just starting all over again yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> um what what are your thoughts on on like songwriting camps and songwriting workshops like have you been part of any of those are there benefits to those i've i've seen a couple um i think it's good just for for the again for the practice of co-writing um mm. there's nothing you, you you only get better at it you know and like working writing with someone else is really its own art form because you got to be okay with them being like ah, i don't think that line's right you know and mm -hmm. you can't get get your pride in the way you just have to be like yeah, okay, so what else, what else do we have? Um, and, and you move on. So writing camps can be great for that. I haven't seen too many of them like get really, really great music that gets cut unless, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the, the bigger side, you know, I know of, of the ones where like Rihanna will bring her people to a, you know, a cabin, but she's there and they know they're writing for Rihanna and she's like hopping in and out of the rooms mm -hmm. being like, hey, this is cool, but I would actually sing it this way, you know? Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that I see get the most like momentum and the most songs out of it. Very good. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and when we talked last time, you were, you had a publishing deal with Sony ATV. I don't know if mm -hmm. that's, that's, is that still the case? Are you? Oh, no, no I don't, I'm not with them anymore. Okay. So I guess who you're working with these days and can you kind of explain what a publishing deal is and how they work? Mm -hmm. um, a publishing deal can work in many ways, but, but the gist of it is um, they kind of, they pay you uh, for, future earnings basically they're paying you a, a, a salary that is recoupable then if and when the song makes money and so you you won't see any of the back end of that song until they make their money back and then you kind of it's a split after mm -hmm. that um and it was i was with sony atv for about two and a half years mm -hmm. um 
at the time I was really ready to kind of do something else. It, Sony TV is the biggest publishing company in the world, uh, which has a lot of advantages, but it can, you can easily be a small fish in a very big ocean. You know, mm -hmm. when you're trying to pitch songs and you know, Bruno Mars is also pitching songs to the same person. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> so uh, unless you find, you know, it's like, it's like a label. You, you want the right A&R who's really behind you. And, and I, I felt like I was, I could do better in another direction. So mm -hmm. once I left Sony, I, um, started working directly with um, uh, a company called All Media Music, which is a single licensing company. Okay. Um, and that's been where the bulk of my um, publishing money has come from, is, is, is from TV syncs. So shows like Jack Ryan or, uh, let's see, iZombie, Criminal Minds. I've had songs in the background of all those shows. Um, and that deal is just, it's just a, they take an initial percentage of the fee you get paid up front, but then all the back end, like, um, um, you know, performance rights, royalty stuff is all yours. Hmm. Yeah. Got it. So instead of them paying you a salary, they're trying to look, in, look for, I guess the difference between a pub deal and a licensing deal is instead of you getting like a kind of a salary up front that's being mm -hmm. recouped, you're only getting paid when they find you stuff um, that actually gets synced and then you get, yeah. They take a commission off of that. Yeah, yeah. And they don't own any publishing at that point. They, they just take a commission off that initial fee. Yeah. Got it. And then, yeah. let's see, do, they, do you write for, um, do you have like a catalog with them or do they give you like writing prompts to write for specific things? Like how does that process it, work? It's, it's really both. When I, when I was, um, uh, my first deal with them was an exclusive deal where just said they have the rights to pitch my music and no one else does. Mm -hmm. And they're not pitching it for artists. This is just, again, for uh, TV, film, and commercials. My, the company I was with really did the most work in, in television. Um, and they definitely, there definitely were, were times they were like, hey, this show needs this kind of song. And they'll send it out to certain people on the team and be like, do you, do you have anything or can you write something within this amount of time frame? Um, yeah. There's another company I started working with as well um, that's taking a different group of my songs. They do a lot of commercials and they'll, they'll be like, I'll, I got an email today. They're like, Hey guys, in the next five hours, I need pitches for this. Um, and, and so it's either you have it, or if you're a great producer, you can make something quickly or you know, you're out of luck basically. Yeah. Yeah. All the songs you wrote when you're, and I don't even get into this, but all the songs you wrote under your, your pub deal, um, are you able to use those songs if they weren't used for anything or? Uh, I can use them, but Sony still owns partial publishing on it. Got it. So, so, so they would have to was, sign off on it on the whole approval process. Yeah. Right? That's how you got a sync yeah, yeah, opportunity. Yeah. I, I could probably release it myself, but you know, for, for it to be used in a TV show or whatever, Sony, and that actually happened um, with, um, with, I had a, a play, the first season of Jack Ryan, I had a song, there's a bar scene and I had this blues rock song that was on an old album and they used it in the back, background of the bar scene. Um, good paycheck. Um, but Sony actually owned the publishing on it but I own the master. So my company uh, was only able to, you know, take a percentage of the master that I got paid. And then Sony got paid the publishing uh, sync. Mm -hmm. fee. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of different stories on like how pub deals work. And I've even heard like the example of there's a Nashville pub deal and then there's a New York LA pub deal and they're both very different. Um, Interesting. Is, is it like a, a lump sum that you get to write a certain amount of songs? Cause I also heard, so it's a, it's a lump sum for let's say 12 songs, mm -hmm. but X percentage of the songs have to chart. And then the difference in like New York oh, and yeah. LA is there's like fractional parts of songs. So if you're four songwriters on a song and only a quarter of it gets counted towards those 12 songs. Yeah, you, uh, it, it's fun. I don't know. I've never had a, a deal. My deal was technically out of New York. I had a rep in, in, in Nashville. Um, so my deal was a little different. I was lucky enough it wasn't a, um, there wasn't a song delivery fee. Um, um, my deal was more for the opportunity. If, if, if my, they thought I was going to, there was po possibilities of, of me getting signed by a major label within that term. And then there would have, it would have moved on to a different kind of deal. So my deal was like really weird where I didn't have a certain amount of songs I had to write. Um, but yeah, a lot of people will have, you need to have 50 songs written within this first year, right. but it's 50 whole songs. Mm -hmm. So uh, like you said, to your point, if, if you write it with one other person, that only counts as a half a song. Right. Um, and then there's definitely, I knew a guy who was like, he had to your, it wasn't necessarily charting stuff, but like cuts, he had to get X amount of cuts within two years 
for him to get the second half of his payments, basically, <laughs> which was like <laughs> blew my mind. Uh, I mean, it worked out for him. He had a bunch of songs in the first Dua Lipa record and, and uh, he's, he's great. So it, he, yeah, it's, it's, he also had kids. So I feel like he had the extra motivation. He's like, well, I got to do this or <laughs> we're all going to starve. So <laughs> um, um, yes, I'm, I'm, that is, that's more common than not to have the split um, be, you know, you, we, we're going to give you this money, but you need to give us X amount of songs mm-hmm. or, or X amount of cuts. Yeah. So it's really important to understand your deal because you might end up writing a lot more songs than you, than you think you're getting into. That's why a good music business lawyer is invaluable. Yes, absolutely. So let's get a little bit into like co-writing. Um, so if you're an independent artist just starting out or maybe you've been writing for a couple of years, what advice would you give to them getting into rooms with more established songwriters? So take me kind of through the journey. Mm-hmm. They're maybe been writing for two years now, haven't really done any co-writes yet. What should a journey be of where they, how they start co-writes and then kind of work their way into writing with more established writers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I will say there's a caveat with this is that like, you know, I haven't seen, just like with artists, I've never seen two songwriters' journeys be the same of how, right. they, got, how they got from A to B. Um, it's the same thing with artists. It's like you never hear, it's never the same stories. Some people jump the line because they knew the right guy and they were ready, you know, so... Mm. Um, but you know, I, I think the best way I, is my, you know, the way I did it was just like, I was just co-writing with my friends cause all my friends in Nashville wanted to be artists or they wanted to be songwriters. So like, you know, we were young and, and, and broken. We had mm-hmm. nothing but time to write all the songs we wanted, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I did that, started going to writer's rounds, um, getting my music out there where at writer's rounds is where I met other new songwriters. Mm-hmm. And so then I write with them and that would open up me to their writing circle and their artist circle um and it just kind of snowballed from that what to, to where all of a sudden you know a couple years down the line i'm writing much better songs mm-hmm. and then and then it's just um ideally if you're writing enough songs you know it's you're getting yourself out there you're, you're getting the eye or attention of like a publishing company or that kind of stuff but all that literally comes from finding the way to get those songs heard and not necessarily heard by an artist or whatever just heard online or at writer's rounds or, you know, wherever you can. You, you had posted some songs on, I forget what the, the story was, but something about SoundCloud where you had posted some songs on SoundCloud and there's people that had reached out to you, I think from, from Sweden or something, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. for like a collaboration. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's how I've, I mean, I've been doing a lot of, good amount of um, top line stuff for DJs for the past couple of years. And, um, uh, a lot of them came from that initially. And then I got with Sony, I got a, um, a really cool top line placement with this band. At the time they were called Tungavag and Robin, which I think is how they pronounce it. They're from Sweden. They were with uh, Sony Sweden. And that song has about 12 to 13 ish million streams on Spotify and a bunch of other smaller DJs heard that, thank you, heard that mm-hmm. song from that and have reached out to me since then. And now from, Another song I had got uh, with this guy, Arcondo, called Paralyzed. I uh, wrote the top line and sang on it. That did really well. And so I had other people reach out because of that. It just kind of like, not a giant snowball, but just small snowballs that kind of, those guys love finding new music. That's, you know, SoundCloud's huge for that. But then also they just, they scour YouTube and all that kind of stuff. Very cool. And you mentioned top line a few times, just for, for those that don't know, like, what does it mean to be like top lining? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, top line. And it's even a thing that, you know, in, in LA, in New York and Nashville, it's, it's a normal t- term now just for a songwriter who ne- doesn't make the track. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I call myself a top liner because I'm more uh, a lyricist and a, and a melody guy. You know, I can, play, I can play instruments, but there's always someone in a room who can play it better than I can. And there's, mm-hmm. at, this, at this time, especially in the pop world, and even, even more so recently in the country world, they started doing it the past couple of years, where like, there's a track guy, which is just a producer in mm-hmm. the room, Who's, who's building out the, the instrumental part of the, tr- the song while you're writing the song. Sometimes they're, they're adding on to the top line, but a lot of guys won't even attempt it. They're like, I know what I do. I'm gonna sit in front of the computer screen. You guys tell me if you hear what you like while you're writing the top line, the, the lyrics and melody, yeah. So with a, with a DJ then, there's two ways where you can write with a DJ. One, and I've done it both. Um, they ask you, do you have any top lines? So I now have a set of songs that I've stripped down to just like, piano and my vo- my voice or sometimes even just acapella mm-hmm. and I'll send them you know the stem of that or the sound cloud of that and they'll build a track around it or the reverse is that hey I have this track 
do you want to try to write a melody and lyrics over it? And I've done that. I've done that too. Got it. What does yeah. your uh, like setup look like, your home studio? Like what kind of gear do you have? And um, like, I guess, how yeah. do you, um, I guess what does your, like almost your desktop, I guess, look like your folders? Like how do you organize things? Like your, your different songs that are maybe written for you or songs that could be for other opportunities? Mm -hmm. I, I've got most of my music so I don't overload my like hard drive and stuff is saved on my, a Dropbox. So I've got like the like Jeffrey James projects for the different EPs I'm working on or, or songs. I've got stuff that I know was just written for sync because it doesn't sound like something I would pitch to anybody or it, and it doesn't sound like a Jeffrey James song. It's just like they needed this genre of songs. So we wrote that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've definitely got songs that like I wrote for other artists um, on there. Um, I've got to save in a couple like other hard drives and stuff too, because I've had too many things crash that like <laughs> always double back up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I've got um, computer wise, uh, my wife, my wife works for a tech company. So she brought me this big, nice uh, Apple screen desktop thing that I have plugged into my computer. And then I have two JBL speakers and an SM7 um, microphone with a little, uh, let me see the, this guy, the shield. <laughs> and honestly, that's, that's, I don't know if you can see the microphone there, but that's really all I have. I have, it's funny, I have uh, like these squares and stuff behind me. I got them, but I didn't buy enough to actually make a difference. So now it's just for like aesthetic purposes. <laughs> <It's> decoration. <laughs> um, but I find with the SM7 and, and the, the, the shield that like I can get great, great, um, great vocals. And it's all running out of a uh, Apollo Twin. Okay. Um, so the Politan's really mobile and, um, you know, I've, I've taken it when I've traveled. Same with the SM7. I, I was in New York first week of March, which was really weird. <laughs> um, uh, right, right as things were getting weird with, with one of my uh, co-writers and we were writing or recording demos out of like the hotel we were in because we could easily, I could just hold the mic. The SM7, um, you might have heard of this, apparently Michael Jackson used that to record most of his vocals and he would just walk oh. around he would walk around the studio with it, just like just like holding it like this, because it's such oh, a, it, it, it only picks up like what's right in front of you. Mm. So it's great for, for if you can't, you know, really get this, the de deadening sound as, as much as you want. Um, and then I got these Sennheiser headphones and that's kind of my, my thing. Oh, I'll, I, and I run Logic. That's kind of my, my system. Okay, very yeah. cool, I love it. And going into uh, a co-write, what should someone prepare going into a co-write with another person? Like what should they bring to it to have a good session? Well, before anything, I'm a big adamant of this. Um, if you, especially if you don't know them, mm -hmm. look them up. And it might, and it might, that might seem like an obvious thing. I've gone into so many sessions that have been set up for me, and the other songwriter or artist like has never heard of me, doesn't know what kind of music I do, and it's just kind of like it's it's unprofessional, you know. Right. And I've and I've Absolutely. I've put myself in that situation a couple times too, and I've always regretted it. So I'm like, man, if I just knew what this person liked we'd more quickly be able to write, you know? So that's like number one, I can't stress that enough. And I, and I have had many songwriters tell me the same thing. Um, and then um, it's, I think it's good to have a cachet of just like melodies and song starts and maybe lyric, uh, you know, titles, just, just in a book somewhere or on your phone somewhere. I'm, I'm always singing melodies into my voice memos. Um, Cause you, if you want a session to really kick off well, let's say you're going into a room, you're writing, you know, you're going to write for the other person. They might be the art, an artist, you know, mm -hmm. listen to a few of their songs. What, what, what do they like? And then like sit down, it takes 10 minutes. It, you know, you could, you can write as much of a song as you want before you go in. Honestly, right. I think it, they, they appreciate it. They're like, Oh, this guy already put time in, to, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to be lazy in this industry mm -hmm. just, and just be like, Oh, we're just writing music. But the people I know who are really successful, put the time in outside of the studio um so it's just it they don't have to be brilliant ideas just be like hey this is really cool i thought your voice might be really good with this kind of melody you know mm -hmm. or just like a little jingle of a mel a half half melody thing um and that that just helps to kickstart everything because you might not start you might not end with that song but it's going to get the juices flow yeah yeah and then i don't i'm sure by a, on a publishing deal they probably do like the business stuff for you um but let's say if you have two writers that are not necessarily working for a publishing company, you're just like independent writers. What should they do in terms of like the business stuff? Um, like one, figuring out who they're writing for, two, um, I guess figuring out like song splits and everything. I think um, 
song splits is definitely something you should always address before you leave the room or, you know, excuse me. If we're writing for like sync, I always talk about it ahead of time because we're talking about a back end money. Like no one's getting paid. Even the producer's not getting paid. So we're like, Hey guys, if we do this, you know, this is specifically for sync licensing. When you know you're, mm-hmm. you're going to pitch it to get placed on TV. And if it does, you're going to get, you could get $10,000. You could get a thousand bucks, but you know, you might, you could get a good amount of money. You just want to talk ahead of time, be like, hey, before we start writing or before we even get in the room, are you cool with these splits? This is how I usually do it. Um, if you're just writing a song, you know, in Nashville, it's usually a given that like if it's three people, it's three way splits. But mm-hmm. it is worth having that conversation, um, even if it's afterwards, you know, but, but get it in an email if you can't get it in writing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with that, I know this isn't the question you asked. It's all good. Um, I, I, w- I was, you know, there's always going to be someone, not always, but it happens a lot where there's someone who's bigger than you. If you are in the room and you're the, the less known person, the less successful, and they want to take a bigger cut of something where their manager tries to do it, like, if it's really, really rude, then like, you know, push back. But like, I always try to look at it like, okay, if I, if I take a cut here, less of a cut here, um, you know, what is that going to get me if this song does get placed? And then I've written a song with this person and now I can mm-hmm. say that, or that's the song gets used by a good artist, you know? And then the other side I always say is, you know, what's a bigger percentage of a song that never gets used. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. it's like, you're always going to write more music. And so you definitely don't want to get walked over, but, mm-hmm. but I think it's worth noting that like, it's okay. You know, you, you don't, y- yeah. 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 I've heard this uh, saying once that sometimes it's better to have a, a small slice of a pie and that's a giant pie versus like having the entire pie with a time the pie is like tiny and yeah. you can barely eat yeah. off of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a quick licensing question and I'll turn it over. I see uh, Christine already has a, has a great question, but um, on terms of licensing, like there's uh, like different themes and stuff I've heard like people tend to write for. Do you have certain types of themes that you write for when it comes to writing for sync and what are those themes yeah there, there's a few different ones I, i'm kind of um in a i'm a little pigeonholed in that world i pigeonhole myself because my voice i'm using the one singing on the the the, 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 the sync stuff and i have a pretty distinct voice and it, it's I'm, I'm definitely like the soul guy you know whether mm-hmm. i want to be or not i can't sing like fun indie rock because it just then sounds like me doing that you know <laughs> so i definitely am and the guy that leans towards like the leon bridges type songs mm-hmm. or um maybe a little more like blues rock stuff um unless i go falsetto and then i can do some more like bonnie there but if, if you listen to a good way to get into sync um just watch your favorite tv show and just pay attention to the music that's in the background um because you'll realize that the lyrics if there's lyrics in it are very specific to the scene Mm -hmm. and so the what they usually want is like you know lyrics that are nondescript that they can be about something but they could be used in any scene so there's not a whole lot of love songs unless it's very specific to that in fact most sync companies and and music uh um supervisors like frown on a lot if they hear a love song or a breakup song they're like okay I, i can't use this for anything so um, so like if I'm writing a Leon Bridges song, I might like talk about like, Hey, we're in this together or like, um, I'm, you know, I'm stronger than that. Like there's a lot of songs about power and strength and overcoming things because there's always an action scene or there's, you know, obviously nowadays there's a lot of scenes about first responders and, and central workers and they're asking for songs about heroes and coming together and then like coming back home when we are through this and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's really focuses on the lyrics as even more than the, 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 the song itself. Mm. Got it. And I'll, I'll hog you for one more question before I turn yeah, it over. Uh, so that's something I really wanted to ask. Um, so on the pod, I listen to this podcast uh, called And The Writer Is a lot. Yeah. And there's quite a few writers on there that I've heard that don't play an instrument. They mostly focus on the top lining and being like the, the lyricist in the room. Um, if you're starting out and let's say you know, because starting out with being more of a lyricist and like having melodies that you, that you hum into a phone, it comes with some challenges um, when it comes to creating content because you always have to hire musicians or producers. So what advice would you give to someone in terms of creating music that's in, in the early stage of their career 
uh, that are more focused on on writing lyrics and melodies and don't yeah play I, mean, I, I think i think when you're writing you don't always you know uh, sorry multiple thoughts in my head there it's okay. um <laughs> it, it's uh, um one again you know if you're doing it on your own just just keep writing it make the journals and, and write write the lyrics but i think the best thing goes back to the co-writing where it's like find a co-writer who does play an instrument mm -hmm. and start working with them because you don't have to pay them you know or or a producer who wants to write the song with you and then mm -hmm. at this point you can write i've done that many times i'm working with a producer who doesn't really do top line stuff he might have thoughts but i'm the top line guy and i'm gonna give him my thoughts on the track and i'm gonna write the top line and we're kind of going back and forth we're like what did this this would be good okay I, this would be cool and and you know who's good at what but then you're like helping each other out you know mm -hmm. so if you're doing it right you still won't have to pay guys unless you do want to make your own album um and but just find people you can you know co-write with who have the skills that you don't and vice versa mm, that's really good advice love that so i'll turn it over to to, to ladies uh lilia fatima and Christina, feel free to either you either Hello. type the questions in the chat or you can just ask them from yourself. I just saw um, the chat thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, how do you structure top lining deals with DJs? Yeah. Um, yeah. Christina. Good question. Um, if I am, uh, there's two sides to it. You know, to any song uh, or recording is the master and the publishing, and the master is like the physical recording itself. Uh, the publishing is the, you know, the the song you wrote, and um, that's kind of the. the layman's <laughs> version of that. Um, so I do, sometimes I talk about it ahead of time, sometimes I don't, but, but usually what it's after I write the song, if everybody's happy with, with, with the track, I then come back and I'm like, if I, if I cut the vocals myself, then I ask for, um, a, if, if, it's, if it's just one DJ, I'll, I'll, I'll ask for half the, half the master. And then if I wrote the top line in the same way, I'll ask for half the publishing um, because he did write the track and the track is the arrangement as well so that they get they get half the publishing as well yeah and and you know it always depends on how many people are writing and that kind of thing but if it's just one and one then that's that's how i start it and also just going off of that how um like if you're doing if you're cutting the vocals like how do you work the like release around that um are you involved with that or how does that work yeah yeah um again it depends on how it's being released and how much I like the song. <laughs> I've yeah. had a few DJ tracks come out and they're like, do you want to be your name on it? I'm like, no, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But usually with those, I'm also asking for like, I'll say, hey, I'll, I, I won't take a part of the master where you pay me X amount of dollars as to be a studio singer almost. Okay. Um, like a buyout. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. A little bit of buyout, yeah. Which actually after this, I'm doing that for a song. I'm cutting the lyrics for a top line I did and, and they're paying me a certain amount. Yeah. Um, and I might end up liking it and still ask them. I won't ask for the master, but I'll be like, hey, I'm happy to have my name on that. Um, cool. If I like it enough, though, being the artist, you can do, it's easy to do a dual release where uh, technically, you know, they're releasing it, but then it's like both of you, it shows up on my Spotify page as much as it does his also. Okay. Um, but if they're not happy with that, like with the, the uh, uh, Cold Blood was the, the, the song I wrote for the Tunga Vagan Robin and it was a label deal on their side so the label didn't care about me at all but they released it was then featuring me i was the featured artist so it's one of those that it um like on spotify specifically it pops up on the appears on yeah section so it, it just pops up there yeah oh, cool yeah thank you of course and congrats on uh the show that's awesome i appreciate it man yeah, we watched it so it was good thanks oh man thank you so much of course <laughs> what are let's see what are, what are some creative ways you engage with your fans Ooh, I'm still, this is a constant battle for me because I'm not huge on like, um, I'm not great on social media. I'm not bad, but there's definitely people who are like much more like making videos every day um, and that kind of thing. And I'm definitely not that guy. I, I've tried to get better at it. But um, right now I've done a bunch of live Instagram lives and Facebook lives. And that's been such, I've, I've seen enough of that grow that I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep doing that because even when we're done with this, it's such an easy way and cheap way, um, cheap from my, like, from my side of like paying musicians or having to travel to go to, go to, go to places. It's such a cheaper way to um, engage with your fans. And you literally almost, you can engage more than a concert because you can actually talk with them and they can, they can see you and there's no tall person standing in front of them or whatever <laughs> it is, you know? Um, I think that's the, the best way I've ever engaged with my fans. Um, it's, I don't know if it's that unique 
but it's, it's what's worked for me. The Facebook lives, do you do a whole uh, virtual tip chart thing as well? Or is it literally just kind of, I haven't, I haven't done the tip yet, man. I've, I've kind of just wanted to keep it like, man, we're all in a weird place. Let's just, let me play some music and hang out. You know, right. um, I, I was lucky enough right before all this happened that I released that EP I made in London and then the new single right before Songland and then Songland came out that like, I've been in a, in a pretty good place. Um, that I was like, you know, I don't, I don't need you guys to tip me. Let's just do this and connect and um, we'll, we'll hang out later on and I'll keep giving you music. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. How long are your Facebook lives? I'll try to do like 30 minutes. Are there okay. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, you know, everyone's got stuff to do and we're staring at computers enough, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Um, Anybody else have any questions for, for Jeff? It's getting darker and darker in here, doesn't it? Let me see if I can. <laughs> yeah, go for it. It'll be a weird um, angle, but it works. So how, because uh, I know a lot of songwriters like just songwrite, and then some people start being wanting to be an artist and then fall into songwriting. Like, what's that division for you? Like, did you start as an artist or like? Yeah, I, I always had artists in mind. Um, I'm a bit of a diva, so like, I always wanted to be the guy on stage. <laughs> um, no, I have lots of friends. I think, yeah, lots of friends who started out as artists and they realized sometimes it just comes down to like, how can you make money the most? And, and if you're an artist, it's easy to burn through cash trying to get to that place where you're making that money back, you know? And a songwriter is not that. Songwriter, you're sitting, you're sitting at home, you can be with your family more, whatever that is. And, and especially if you're not someone who loves traveling, then like, or traveling in a touring way, um, lots of people choose songwriting because you can stay in Nashville or wherever you are and just, and just write and write and write. It's a nine to five job at that point. It's still creative, very creative, but that's, it's, that's the closest you get to a nine to five in, in our world, I think. <laughs> yeah. That, does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, and great, great episode. I love Songline too. That, like what you said about, I love that analogy about the, the Shark Tank. <laughs> it's the best yeah. way to describe it. Yeah, I love it. Really good. That was the only way I could explain it before people had like seen the episode. I was like, they're like, so is, is it alive? I was like, no, and there's no audience. It's like, it's Shark Tank. Yeah. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll throw another question in, but y'all don't feel feel shy to, to ask questions while we while we have Jeffrey. Um, definitely very thankful to have him, and it's a great opportunity for you to ask some good questions here. Um, so, question I had. Now I'm blanking out. I said that. <laughs> um, oh, real quick, I do have a. Yeah. It's a time to get a ring light. I do have a ring light. Right. It only works when you use it. Well, I, did, I got <laughs> a ring, light. ring light just falling. So. <laughs> I got a ring light from Amazon and I literally just broke it out the other day. So I was, I've, I've seen the beauty and the magic of the ring light. So. Oh, it's amazing. But I got this, I got this cheap one when I got it. So it's like, it's hovering over my tall screen. So it's not really working that well. Oh, well. I forgot to get the thing to, to put the phone in. So I had to like tape it, tape my phone to the back of the that. ring light, but it all worked. <laughs> um. What was the question I was going to ask? Now, I, I completely linked now. Oh, I'm not saying attention. Well, I guess another one to add to is what does your team look like right now? Like being like someone that's writing for sync yeah. and writing for, for licensing deals, do you need much of a team or what does like team look like that you work with? No, you definitely still do, man. It's always, there's always another part of the industry that, that you really can't um, get the most out of without having someone represent you. Um, so I, I have a I'm, same music, uh, man, uh, not manager, music, um, lawyer that I've had for years. He was the first part of my team I got. I have a really good rep at um, ASCAP here in Nashville. Nashville is much better. The PROs are a lot more involved on the ground. Feet up, foot on the, foot on the ground? Boots, boots on the ground? Boots on the ground. <laughs> it's a song, yeah. Um, and um, they're really good. My, uh, Evan Musto at, at ASCAP for me in Nashville. Is, is, yeah, I can almost, I can point a direct link between her and most of my team. She's the one who brought people out because she liked my music. I sent, I, sent, I sent it to her and she was like, oh, this is great. Let me send it out to other people. And that's not a normal thing for other parts of the industry. Um, but the, uh, I have a, uh, I still tour as an artist when touring is allowed. So I have, a, I'm with UTA, United Talent Agency. Um, a guy here in Nashville has been with me for years. Um, just kind of started talking to a new management company. Um, I know I was with somebody when, when we first talked um, and, and we've kind of had a manager. He was great. And it was just kind of time to, to move on in different places and um, just started talking with them. Um, when I released music, um, my last, my EP and then the single, I had hired a publicist out of New York um, who was great, really great. And just, just for 
I mean, I can't, it's funny, like blog looks won't get you much, but it'll get you more than, than like nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, she's been really, really great about that for my videos and my music. Um, I think else was my team. I mean, my wife is like kind of the silent partner of my team. She literally, <laughs> when I'm in a pinch, she like, I mean, she does uh, marketing and, and brand management stuff anyway. So she designs all my like last minute videos and, and like a good, like, you know, branding look on online is also invaluable. So, so she does all that stuff for me. Very cool. And now you mentioned touring, I was going to ask you, um, what, so when this is all over and you can tour again, what does an ideal, I guess, kind of life look like for you? Because since you are, you know, having success with songwriting and, and singing. Pause you quick. I spilled a little yeah. bit of water and it's falling out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible for the video. I apologize. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching it like, I was like, how long, how far is it going to go? It's like, oh, let's get in my equipment now. <laughs> a mess over here, guys. I'm so sorry. It's all good. Jeez. I remember it's my good. first Zoom. Jeez. <laughs> all right. Okay. So. So when this is all over, this whole COVID-19 stuff, and you can tour again, yeah. since you ha have success as a songwriter, and you don't necessarily, I don't know, I, mean, I don't know how successful it is, but I don't know if, if you need to tour, you probably don't need to. Um, what does an ideal, I guess, life look like for you? Because the road can be brutal. And me yeah. being on the live side of the business, um, and I, I preach a lot to, for artists to find other revenue streams. So you can maybe only tour 50 to 80 shows a year instead of 150 to 200 because it's just so brutal on your body, on your health, on, uh, on your mental health. And I just see it day in, day out. You know, even whether you're in a van in a trailer or you're in a bus because the, the yeah. difference between the two, a bus tour is just going to be a longer day. So now instead of showing up at the club at 4 o'clock, you're there at 8 a.m. and just drove through the night. So it's very brutal lifestyle to tour that heavily. So what, I guess what's an ideal lifestyle look like for you? Or do yeah, you want a tour like that? <laughs> it's, it's it, no, it, I think it's, you're hinting at, it, it's a healthy mix of all that, man. Cause I still um, love being an artist and I love performing. So I'm, I'm going to be playing out shows still um, as much as I can, but the, you know, the songwriting and the writing for sync has been a nice, a nice way of like, Oh, I can be home and, and still have money coming in and, and all that. And then I can record for myself or, you know, help other artists record. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, doing the top lines, getting paid, to sing other song, other people's songs has also been a great thing. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Anybody else have any other questions for for Jeffy? Uh, I do. Yeah. Uh, like I know you mentioned the songwriter, but like as an artist, like now with all this chaos going on, like what are your plans to like for the future? Like, do you have anything thought out, or just gonna wait it out and write in the meantime? No, I mean we're we're game planning for you know what the next six months and then what the next twelve months are gonna look like. Um, I have a cache of songs that I really love that I, that I own the masters to that I'll, I'll, I'm already kind of planning on the next singles I want to release. Cause um, people are still listening to music and I'm, and I'm happy to, to give people more music to listen to. Um, the sync world is still happening. So I'm, I'm still writing a bunch. I've been doing that this whole time, writing a bunch for um, sync, sync TV and film stuff. Um, I actually just found out about a, a movie thing I might have, but, but uh, I don't want to talk too much because those can always fall apart any moment, yeah. but I could also find out like in an hour that we got it. So it'd be great. That's kind of where my head's at with all that though. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah. I have a quick question. Um, how do you structure like a producer deal? Like, do you include that in um, a contract with the splits or how do you work that? Yeah. Um, that. Um, there's multiple ways you can do that, man. Just, especially if, if the, if the producer's on, you know, if he was part of the writing process, then he's going to obviously get some publishing uh, and that can come into play with like, Hey, you know, you're getting this anyways. So you might do, could, would you be able to do less here? And, but usually it just starts with reaching out and being like, Hey, I want to release this song. Um, how, what can I do to buy you out of the master side um, to, okay. to, you know, so it's, that's the biggest thing is, is um, um, as I'm sure Chris could tell you, like, owning your own masters these days is like the best way you can make money as an independent artist. Um, mm. And so it's, it's been great for me to be able to do that. And, and if, if it's too much, if they want, you know, way too much money, um, then, then it's like, okay, so how much to buy part of the master? And, and then, you know, this what you can ask, you can ask anything. You're going to say part of the master and then X amount, of when we recoup, you know, if I pay you this much more, if you recoup it first, can I then own the master at one point? Okay. Or is this the way it's always gonna be? And then you, but you agree 
even if you're not owning the master, getting them to agree that like they don't have to sign off on any way you want to release the song. Yeah, I have I have a situation like that where someone, the producer, took 50% of the master and I want it back. <laughs> um, yeah, so. It's hard, man. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's it's complicated there. Um, yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I, I, it's, it, sometimes it's got to be like, all right, well, that's just what the song's going to be, right? And and hoping there's always, there's always more songs. That's, exactly. that's kind of always my opinion, man. Always more songs. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. No problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it might be worth asking, you know, is there, amount, is there an amount that you would want at this point, you know, knowing if, if you're looking on the back end, knowing how much money is or isn't coming in, could you come to them and be like, hey, is there an amount you would want that I could then buy you out of the rest of this? Okay, that's with cool. that lands. Because if they say no, or if they say crazy money, then you can always be like, okay, we'll just keep it as it is, you know? Okay. It is with two sync um, uh, agencies, so hopefully that will help. Yeah, but that's good to know because I never thought about um, having them either recoup it first or stuff like that. So that's great. Yeah, great. Okay, cool. Good. Good. Awesome. Very cool. Good question. Anything else? Anyway else? Right, so I'll just throw a, a, a fun question here at the, at the end. Uh, what are some, some books, documentaries, or podcasts that you recommend and share the most? Ooh. Podcast. Uh, I've been listening. Should these all be uh, music business? Either or. Just either, okay. It um, uh, depends on your humor, but uh, John Mulaney and Nick Kroll have a podcast. It's Oh Hello, the podcast. And it's based on their uh, stage play they did. And it's really freaking hilarious. I think those guys are geniuses. So that podcast has been great. Um, and then You Made It Weird is another uh, podcast. And I'm blanking on the guy's name. He's a comedian, but he just does really great interviews. It's just an interview based thing, you know, like. Um, like the the WTF podcast or whatever, but I just, I, th I like this guy a lot. Um, TV shows, you know, I just watched, um, what is it? Well, one, I'm about to finish, refinish uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, which is a whole other thing. But uh, <laughs> uh, I did also finish, um, man, what's the show? Ozark. Ozark is great. Mm, Season three of Ozark. Money, yeah. dude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw Lilia mentioned Pete Holmes. Um, I love that show. Pete Holmes, there it is, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Pete Holmes is the guy who hosts, um, oh, nice. He hosts the uh, You Made It Weird podcast. Okay, I don't know Thank that. you, Lilia. Yeah. yeah, I love his TV sh uh, that show yet on HBO, Crashing. So Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Well, thanks so much for, for taking the time and for sharing. It's good uh, to connect with you again. And um, yeah, it's really appreciate you uh, giving back and teaching everyone, answering everybody's questions. So great to talk, man. Thanks for, thanks for, you, you give some of the best interviews I've ever had. So I appreciate it, man. Oh, thank you. I appreciate thanks, it. Yeah. And then I'll ask you this one more time though, to kind of end it. Um, I asked, asked you this last time, but how I always end every interview is what's your definition of making it? Ooh. Um, wonder how I, I, I got to go back and listen to how I asked, how I answered last time now after I answered this. Um, my definition of making it um, is being happy with the art I've made and being able to feed myself. Love it. Yeah. I can actually look at what you said last time. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I have around the page. <laughs> oh man, amazing. So it changes every year. <laughs> there we go, okay, there we go. So it's my current one. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Cool. Well, thanks so much again. Have an awesome day and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks guys. Nice to meet you all. Okay.